Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco SY. Today we're going to be sitting down with Rich Barber, who is an account manager at an electrical equipment company based in Richmond, Virginia. Rich, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Looking forward to talking with Rich. Uh, just for our listeners, Rich has got a has been with the company for quite a while. He's got an interesting story. He serves industry uh, better than anybody I've ever had the privilege to work with. Rich and I have actually did a lot of work together in Virginia back when I was up there uh, working in the motor service days. And uh, it was always just you know, top level professionalism. And Rich, uh, I think our listeners that they'll see that you, you know, why you excel at what you do by, through this conversation. So maybe to kind of kick them off, just t- give them a little bit about your journey and your background to where you're at now. Well, Chris, I, I appreciate it. You're too kind, but nice being able to chat with you today. I, I guess going back, I was uh, had some experience in high school with electrical trades, uh, Votech, got out of there, went into the union apprenticeship and decided I wanted, wanted to do something a little different. So I actually went back to school, got a degree in uh, programming and worked for Reynolds Metals and Blue Cross and, and doing that. At some point in time, I d- decided I didn't really like sitting in a cube programming. I really like being outside. But ended up working for a Japanese company in the industrial arena uh, selling pneumatics. And I was there for several years. Then I moved over to the electrical side, got a job with Busman, who's one of our vendors, called on Eco, and Mark Holmes approached me one day and was wanted to talk to me about coming to work for Eco. So he, he had uh, known that I called on large OEMs. So he went to see one of them that was an Eco customer. He told him he was thinking about hiring me but he was concerned that I didn't know the, the, uh, the, the business. So the customer told him, he said, look, we know Rich. We know he'll take care of us. We'll teach him what he needs to know. And, I, uh, you know, that's, that's how I'm here today. I'm very fortunate. I was very humbled that uh, they stuck their neck out for me and made me work harder for them. But uh, that's, that's uh, in a nutshell how I got to, got to ECO. Okay. Very good. Now, where did you go to school at, Rich? Uh, JMU. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Now, you, the programming you were doing, what type of programming was that? I was working for Reynolds Metals doing uh, mainframe and uh, AS400 programming. And then I went over to Blue Cross Blue Shield and headed up a, uh, their accounting department for AS400 as well there. Okay. I, I can definitely feel your pain, too. When you, uh, I, I learned very quickly after engineering school that, you know, sitting in a cube and programming code, it's not something that uh, brought me the joy. I wanted to be out too. So uh, I think we cut from the, the same cloth on that, man. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's just something about getting out and being out in industry that is, it's so much fun, you know, and you're, you're in industry so much and you see so many different things. You know, what do you see for, as the greatest challenges that industry has coming? And, and I know COVID's throwing a lot at us, so it's hard to look maybe five years out, but it, we, we may have to go closer to a, a 12 to 24 month window. What would that look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Chris. You know, um, even before COVID, with the global economy, things have really gotten uh, more competitive, tighter. And our, our customers, like us, are having to do more with less. In, in our case, the people we call on, they're having to do more more uh, business with less engineering resources. So they're, they're really leaning on us to try to help them find some of the uh, engineered solutions because of that. So uh, they're, also their buying habits are changing. You're seeing a younger workforce, and they're more social media-centric. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking to uh, reach them with uh, uh, social media, with uh, e-commerce. So we're having some challenges there, too. The old school guys that like to sit down and do a face-to-face. We're having to try to reach out and change some of our ways that we interface with customers. Yeah. I mean, how you, so you, you mentioned social media. How do you see that playing right now? What, what's the, 
I guess what's the biggest platform that you see is is that you, you need to engage on if you want to be successful in the future? Well, for, certainly we've got a e-commerce platform uh, that we're that's not that's not just social media, but it is uh, it is one way we're starting to see customers uh, they they don't have to they can just get on order what they want and get off. So, but uh, otherwise, you know, you're seeing a lot of people that are reaching out uh, via LinkedIn. There's a number of platforms, so I, you know, I guess trying to dabble on all of them right now is probably important. But it's gonna it continues to move into the future. So we'll just have to try to, as a company and as a, as salespeople, we're just gonna have to try to uh, determine. It's like everything, you know. What what are my my customers maybe doing something different than your customers? And uh, so we have to be engaging. We have to understand what platforms that uh, that particular customer may use a lot of times peer influence uh, can be a, very effective so uh, we, we just have to understand what they're using and then try to engage no doubt man no doubt i mean if you were to look back over your career right now and you know we've all learned from some from mistakes sometimes do you have anything that jumps out as a really good learning moment for you that maybe our listeners could get some value from yeah you know what one still kind of sticks out as a, a sore spot for me you know, we, we had a big opportunity and a big industrial customer. In hindsight, you, you really, you know, I, I thought we had it all set up. We had all the technical guys. We were loaded for bear, but our audience was not engineers. Our audience were money people, production people. They, they were looking for a solution. We had technical guys engaged, and we spent too much time talking technical jargon and, uh, you know, the, the people that were there, they could care less about technical. They wanted a solution. Uh, we ended up losing that project, and I, and I attribute it to that. I, I take ownership of it. I didn't properly steer our resources. So you really have to know, you have to know your audience. What do they want? And uh, this particular audience, they just wanted to see our solution. They could care less about uh, what the components were to provide that solution. So I, I learned from that, and so I'm... I really try to think hard about who my audience is uh, and what they want to hear, what their solution needs to be. No doubt, man. I mean, so from an advice standpoint, there, there are obviously listeners out there that we're trying to inspire to, to come to this industry, whether it's manufacturing or to support industries like Eco. What would that advice be? Because you definitely have a, a lot of, of experience out there that you'd like to offer up to, for somebody that wants to pursue a career in this field. Well, I, I tell you, coming from uh, when, when I got into this field 24 years ago, I guess, it, it can be very rewarding. It's, it's very exciting. It, it's always something different. But you, uh, you, you have to be able to multitask. You've uh, you got to be able to accept defeat at times, but you got to keep showing up to the plate. You got to keep swinging for the fences. And sometimes we don't always have the best solution or the best price just and so we sometimes we can't we can't win that project but I, I tell you something i've always believed firmly in is if you do what's right for the customer it's going to pay off in the long run and sometimes the best thing you can do for the customer is recommend to them to go with the solution our competitor is offering and that sounds kind of counterintuitive but that builds in my experience that builds credibility when they know that you're doing what's best for them what you know I don't look at it as sales people and customers. I, I look at it as building partnerships and we're here to find solutions for the customer. And um, they may occasionally go to the competitor, but if you can get them to come to you first, then you, then you're successful. And so that's, that's the advice I have. If you do as a customer, do what's right for the customer and build that partnership. It can be rewarding and, and it always works out in the long run. No doubt, man. No doubt. And one t a lot of times people think of sales, they have this perception, right? And good or bad in their brain. And this is an opportunity I'm going to give you right now to to debunk that. So if there's a common myth that's out there that, you know, when people say sales, they think of this. And in reality, you know what it is. What would that be? Common myths. <laughs> Common myths are that uh, salespeople don't do anything but play golf and take customers, you know, out to dinner. If you want to be a good salesperson, you, you got to work. 
you got to show up to the plate every day consistently. You know, you have got to just take care of customers. You've got to find out what they need. And uh, you've, got, you've got to work. We have such a diverse customer base and a vendor base. So what's right for one you know, customer is not right for the next. So as a salesperson, you know, you've got to connect the dots. You, you've got to show them, first of all, you've got to understand what is the needs of that customer? What is their machine? What do they do? And then what, what do we have in our bag of tricks that can help provide solutions that they need? So, you know, this, it's not like we go out and see customers and we throw, throw it over the fence and somebody else does the work. You know, you've you got to do the work. That's probably one of the myths that I hear more than anything is, you know, get into sales and you just, you know, play golf all the time. That is not the case. Amen to that, my friend. Amen to that. Uh, it, it's so true. And I think you, uh, you exemplify that with your work ethic. And, and if you want to be successful, you know, you got to hustle and you got to get out there and, you, and, you, and you're always looking for that, the best interest of your, your end user and who you're supporting. And so, Rich, people that are that are wanting to enter and wanting to learn more, what are some resources that you use to, uh, that have helped you in the past and that maybe are helping you right now to stay on, on top of your skills? One of the things I liked about Eco when I first came is that we have so many tenured people. And when you have a company that has a lot of tenured people, that tells you something about the company. You know, I was talking to guys that have been, been in sales for 25 years, 30 years. I leaned heavily on those guys, you know, I've got great coworkers throughout the, throughout the company. And then the other thing that I saw is that if you're going to go work for a distributor in Virginia, I would not want to have to compete against electrical equipment company because we have the best vendors. So we've got solid, solid employees. We've got solid vendors. Uh, we're, we've got top tier vendors. And with those top tier vendors comes a lot of experience, a lot of manufacturing background, and we've got a lot of uh, resources just from the nature of the products that we have access to. So that's that's big. No doubt, man. No doubt. How about mentors, man? Who, who's been out there that's been you know pretty big mentor for you in your career? I would say that probably my dad. Uh, he he wouldn't he he doesn't know this, but he's probably the biggest mentor because from from a young age of probably seven years old. Every summer, I was out with my dad. He owned a construction company. He did footings and poured concrete. And so every summer, that was my job. I worked for my dad. I was always trying to trying to please him, do it better. But you know that that instilled in me a work ethic. You know, he's old school. He, you know, he came up fairly poor, so he he made it on his own. And uh, I think I, I think I took more of that work ethic from him than uh, anything else. So he's probably the number one mentor. No doubt. I mean, that's great, man. I mean, if you were working, doing concrete work in the summer, that's some, that's some tough work right there, my friend. Yeah. He taught, he taught me that I did not want to do footings. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned that pretty quickly. That's, that's a, that's a role you didn't want to pursue. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, other influences, man? Any other inf uh, people that have been influential to you? Uh, well, if you just think about inside of, of uh, Eco, uh, you know, I've had three managers, and they were—they've all been uh, influential. I, I think back, uh, Mark Holmes. You know, if you think about it, you know, he—he's really stuck his neck out because you know, here's a new new sales guy coming in. You got a bunch of sales guys that have been here for years, and and Mark, he—he he put me on some large accounts. He really uh, showed confidence in me, and I didn't want to let him down. So I'll. I tell you, I worked so hard to grow the business in those uh, large accounts. So uh, he was influential. You know, I, I remember uh, Mark Fox was my next manager, and he helped me appreciate how we, we look at expenses. If we're going to try to do something for a customer, well, is that how you would spend your own money? Is it a good investment? So that, uh, that helped me understand a good perspective on uh, how we use our, our funds. And then, you know, uh, Brian Logan, my current manager, and uh, he is he's extremely supportive, great motivator, um, just kind of guy that makes you want to makes you want to please him by, you know, hitting your goals. So I, I couldn't be happier over the years with just uh, the leadership uh, on the sales side that we've had. We had a lot of good people that have influenced me, but off the top of the head, those are uh, those are three good motivators right there. 
No, no doubt they are, they are three excellent ones. And for our listeners, uh, Mark Holmes is the CEO of Electrical Equipment Company now. Uh, Mark Fox is the vice president of sales in Virginia. And Brian Logan is the sales manager over Central Virginia. And, and all three uh, wonderful, wonderful people to work with. So, Rich, thank you for 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 recognizing them and for what they've done for you in your career. And and Rich, I'm just trying to think about you, you and when you're the happiest, man. What what brings you the most joy in your work? I'm I'm kind of a competitive guy in nature. So uh, when when I'm able to um, outsell the competition, bring the best solution, and then have have a customer recognize that, there's uh, that's that's kind of the thrill is to, is to get the recognition that the customer is happy with the solution. And especially if they follow up later and say, man, this, I'm glad we made this decision. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that to us. Um, it, it's, it's very rewarding when we can find latent needs of a customer because of, uh, you know, take lighting, uh, energy savings, you, you know, all different types of things. And if we can apply it and take it to the customer, and show them, hey, I could, I could uh, save you some money, or I can improve your process. And they, and they weren't looking for it. Boy, that's that's very satisfying. No doubt, no doubt. Last, last work related question. It would be, what do you wish you had more time to do? Well, you know, the the struggle is, uh, you know, because you know, I've got some technical background with computers and stuff like that. I, I really. I wish I had more time to be more technical, but uh, I realized the best thing I can do for, for my customers is, is to be the jack of all trades, but a master of none. So that's, that's sometimes a struggle, but I've got to rely on, we've got a wealth of uh, vendors, uh, product managers. We have all the people that have the skills. So it's, uh, I kind of look at my job as being a point guard. I'm not the scorer. I'm just distributing the ball to the guys that can slam dunk the ball. So I have to understand enough of what we have, our solutions, and to connect the dots with our customers and then bring in the technical guys to take it home. So that's just the nature of the business. My personal thing is I like to be technical, but there's a balance, and I just have to you know, accept that. Right, right. Well, that drives you, man. And uh, knowing when, who to pull in at what times to get, to get that solution right for your end user is so important. And for our listeners, I, I know there's plenty of them out there who wish they had more support like that in the plant from, from you know, from the resources that are coming in. So, you know, again, hats off to you. So let's take a left turn down a dirt road, man. We'll get out of the work, the work talk for a while. You know, what do you wish you had more time to do that when you're not at work? Well, I, I love to fish. You know, I've been fishing for a lot of years. We just don't get a... You know, I'm a fresh, I'm a saltwater fisherman, so we we spend a lot of time on the Chesapeake Bay. I would love to fish more, but uh, that that day will come, but uh, not now. I hear you, not now. So, do you have a, a boat that you go out on? Yeah, we we've got a little uh, Carolina skiff that we go out and fish the rivers, and uh, we'll we'll go up and fish the Bay Bridge Tunnel, and we'll take it uh, take it to Nags Head and fish down there, and just. Uh, we dink around and and uh, speckled trout fishing and you know uh, drum fishing and yeah we uh, I've got a I've got a fourteen year old is just eat up with fishing he uh, he fishes he he'll fish twelve hours a day if you let him. I hear you, man. I mean, what you kind of led right into my my next question because we definitely like sharing with our listeners as much as we can about outside of work and our families. So, what could you share with us here? Uh, well, uh, I've got a very supportive wife. She's very patient. You know, a lot, a lot of guys, a lot of guys like uh, me are probably very driven, a type personalities, and um, she's very uh, supportive. I've got a, I've got a 17 year old that he's in high school. He's actually taking mechatronics, so they, I've been able to take him into some customers, showing some stuff that I wish I would have seen when I was that age. And uh, he's he's very interested in our industry, so uh, he's doing well in that program. He's in the you know first robotics program, doing the robots and all that stuff. And again, like I said, my my youngest he he lives to fish. So yeah, got uh, got a full family here. And then of course we've got uh, two small dachshunds that are my wife's dogs. <laughs> just just to clarify, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, man, it sounds like you got a lot going on, man. I mean, so any fun fishing stories with you and your son? What any uh, any big catches that you'd like to share? You know, it, it is funny. Um, I, uh, I so I'm I'm one of those guys that don't get to fish a lot, but I, I do a lot of reading. So when I go fishing, typically I've read about it. So you know, last year I took my my boys out to the Bay Bridge Tunnel, and I told them we were going to target. Uh, we were going to target some sheep's head. So we went up to, uh, you know, we we're uh, fishing the pylons and uh, I told my son, you know, I was motoring the boat and I said, we're going to motor up here and you kind of fish to him. I'll tell you what you need to do. And so we fished about three pylons and, and we were going to the fourth because they hang on the pylons eating barnacles. And so he's fishing the fourth and he turns around and goes, this ain't going to whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, by the time he got that out of his mouth, the pole bent over in half, and uh, it was one ounce from a citation. So that was our first sheep's head. And uh, from that point on, he, uh, what do we do next, Dad? <laughs> so, right. That was a good story. But yeah, we have uh, we, we we enjoy fishing. But uh, yeah, that was a good one. That is a good one, man. And you're in the right spa- uh, place in Virginia to to get some good access. So you know, Rich, we we always like to. To kind of summarize Eco Ask Why episodes, when we get to the why, and we get and where we're talking about purpose, and you know we we all go to work hopefully for more than to just to get a check. You know we want to we want to bring you know value somewhere. We want to drive it drives us. So what would be your answer to you know why you do what you do? What would be your purpose? Well, I, I, and I agree with you. I uh, I. I really have never um, chased a paycheck when I, uh, I, I tell you this real quick, but when I, you know, I was working in the IT field, I was making good money. Uh, I didn't like that. And for a short stint there, I went back and, and worked for my dad and told him I needed, you know, I needed to find something I enjoyed and, and I just got married. So I went, I went, uh, took a pay cut there. And then when I went to SMC, I took another pay cut and my wife looked at me sideways to say, well, you know, here I got married to you and you've taken two pay cuts by making career changes. I told her, I said, you know, if I find something I enjoy, uh, I'm convinced that the money will come, but find something you enjoy. And, and I've, I enjoy the, what we do. I enjoy going into plants. I, I enjoy seeing that the show, um, how it's made. That's what we do. So uh, I've been very fortunate, very blessed that eco has kept me this long. But I'm not chasing a paycheck. I'm, uh, I'm taking care of customers, uh, seeing what they make, trying to help them make it better. And at the, as a result of that, I'm making a paycheck. So I'm, uh, I've always been convinced if you just find something you enjoy, what's the old saying? If you, if you find what you like, you'll never work a day in your life. I can't quite say that, but it's, it's, it's daggone close. Absolutely, man. I think in just, just the way you serve others, uh, you know, that, that has really served you well. And, and so, Rich, thank you so much for taking the time with us on Eco Ask Why. I know you brought a lot of, of value to our listeners. You know, there's probably people out there that want to pursue a career, you know, and maybe they want to pursue a career in sales. And, you know, if, if I was, you know, at that point and could listen to the insight that you just brought, it would connect so many dots. So I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on and for what you shared with us. So I hope you have a great day. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Chris, and uh, thank you for what you do. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.